Good evening, and welcome to the February 6, 2018 Prince George's County Board of Education Fiscal Year 2019 Budget Work Session. Before we begin, I would like to ask everyone to silence or turn off any wireless communication devices as they may interfere with the taping of the meeting. Mrs. Berkeley, can you please call the roll? Present. Mr. Burroughs? Ms. Eubanks? Here. Ms. Hernandez? Mr. Murray? Mrs. Quinteros Grady? Mrs. Roche? Mr. Valentine? Mr. Wallace? Mrs. Williams? Dr. Wiseman? Page, Dr. Eubanks. Thank you. Some of my colleagues are back in the room and they probably be out here shortly, but we want to start because I want to, I'm a stickler for starting on time so we can finish earlier. <laughs> the Board of Education has convened this evening for the sole purpose to discuss the fiscal year 2019 budget. The work session this evening is the second of three budget work sessions and three public hearings that this board is conducting to develop its budget submission for consideration by the county executive for fiscal year 2019. The purpose of these budget work sessions is to fine tune the budget proposal sent to us by CEO, Dr. Kevin Maxwell, so that it meets all of our highest priorities and represents the best spending plan that will serve all of our students and staff across the county. I will now turn this session over to Dr. Maxwell for our opening statement regarding this evening's discussion. Thank you, Ms. Boston, members of the board. This is indeed the third of three work sessions. And uh, Mr. Fister, I'm gonna turn it over to him again to walk you through beginning of the presentation and then uh, make whatever questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Maxwell. Um, this is the almost identical presentation that we've seen in the prior two work sessions, so you know, indulge me. We'll, we'll go through it very quickly and we can always go back and ask some for some additional questions. But the document itself uh, is available in board docs. It's also available in our budget um, uh, website, so we can go through this rather quickly. As we've talked about before, the entire budget is, is geared towards fulfilling the promise of our strategic plan, outstanding academic achievement for all students. When we did the survey earlier in the fall regarding um, to, get, to garner some public input into the budget, um, we received 147 responses. Those responses were broken up into these particular categories with compensation, class size, school facilities being some of the top three. Uh, response categories. Just wanted to make mention that number four was the interest in our specialty programs. <clears throat> through the work of the FAB committee and through other discussions with other committees on the, uh, that the board has, uh, they proposed five priorities that they would like to see funded in this budget. Those five are compensation, pre-kindergarten expansion, maintenance, English language learner supports, and student-based budgeting. Some of the other committees also would like to see um, community schools added, which it was, and also uh, security needs for our students in our, in our schools. And the dollar amounts represented of each of these board priorities is highlighted there on the, the right side. The fiscal year 2019 Chief Executive Officer's proposed budget is $2.1 billion, which is $131 million, or 6.7% above the FY18 budget. When we prepare the budget, we break this up into several areas and we kind of do it like a stair step. Those things at, at the highest priority are those things that we're legally required to do or mandated by law. Those things such as you know, increasing enrollment in our charter schools and expansion there, we're required to fund that on a per pupil basis. Uh, continuing the dual enrollment, our teacher and employee retirement costs continue to go up, uh, compensation for our settled agreements already, and then some risk management policy increases here. So these five things here total $47.1 million, which represents our highest priorities. 
The second layer is what we consider cost of doing business. They're not legal, but they are some of the things that we're continuing to do and to maintain we still provide those products and services. Um, these things total $19.9 million, and that's some of our facilities, our supplies and contracted services. As we know, we need additional support there. Transportation, health insurance costs for our employees, again, keep going up. And then the transfer of a Youth Career Correct Connection Grant, um, where the grant is expiring, and we're expecting to bring those two positions into the operating budget. We also have program continuations, which is our, you know, for some of our academic programs, such as language immersion, our arts integration, Pete Heck and 3D scholars programs, and again, as the board's priority pre-kindergarten expansion is shown here, these five or six items total for $5.7 million. Now we get into the pillars of our strategic plan. And the first one is academic excellence. And I'm not gonna read all these, because like I said, we've seen this multiple times. Uh, but basically, your academic programs, your ELL supports, some of the new requirements under ESSA, uh, healthy start breakfast to make sure our children are fed when they're in the classroom. These items here total $14.2 million in the, the pillar of academic excellence. Continuing in academic excellence is our higher achievement pilot at Charles Carroll Middle School, student engagement and supports, area office staffing, student information uh, system enhancements, and so on and so forth. In our focus area two, which is the high performing workforce, here you'll see some additional money for some cultural culture training, uh, human resources staffing, continuing the expansion of our peer assistance and re uh, review teachers, and then some additional funds within talent development. These five items here, four, I'm sorry, four items, total $1.7 million. Safe and supportive environments, our focus area number three, $10.7 million focuses on some of our needs in our maintenance and facility shops, along with some security and warehouse. Focus area four, family and community engagement, $1.1 million for some outdated, replace some outdated communication equipment, uh, diversity office contractual interpreters, and parent engagement assistance. And then finally, our last strategic uh, pillar, organizational effectiveness. This is to continue the work uh, the graduation uh, audit work that we're doing, and then additional staffing to bring some outside legal services in-house to uh, cut some costs there. These two items are $788,000. When the CEO proposed his budget, uh, we expected $10.1 million in federal revenue, and that is restricted funds. We estimated $27.2 million from the state, a uh, small amount of an increase in board sources, which is our out-of-county tuition, interest income, things like that. And then there was no proposal to use any funds from fund balance, so that's showing as a negative $22 million because we used $22 million in fund balance in the current year. So with all the things that we saw before, those enhancements totaled up to $131.5 million. So to make the balanced budget, which we're required by law to do, we have to ask the county for $115.9 million. And that's based on an estimated increase of 2,144 students. Since the proposed budget was published, we've received some updated state numbers. That's the only reflection here. Change, uh, we are expecting an additional $4 million in state revenue. So again, to keep the number at the $131.5 million, we reduced uh, what would potentially be the county ask down to $111 million. And again, those, these increases are based on our final uh, enrollment of 2,000. 226 students above last year. Even though we're talking about a $4 million swing in revenue from state to county, it only amounted to about a 0.2% change between the county funding and the state funding as reflected here on this pie chart. Our fund balance at the end of last year, June 30th, 2017, was $136.6 million. However, a lot of those funds are already accounted for and cannot be used for future budgets. So with the money that we have here, and as I mentioned, we have FY18 revenue of $22 million committed, some things from last year and other committed commitments, it leaves $22.4 million of unassigned fund balance. That number represents about 1.1% of our operating budget. We always talk about maintenance of effort from what the county uh, gives us, and if, for, for those in the audience, maintenance of effort is the county must fund us on the per pupil amount 
the equivalent this year as it was in last year. If we have including, uh, increasing enrollment, we should see an increase in this number. So the county's MOE for next year is $12 million. There is some dedicated tax revenue shifts of the negative $1.2 million. So the county ask, as we mentioned before, was $111.6 million. They're required to give us 12. So our request above maintenance of effort is $100.8 million. Tonight's discussion will focus uh, on sort of the business side of the house. We have Chief Operating Officer section, Business Management Services, Information Technology, Supporting Services. We have some staff here to talk about grants if need be, and then we can talk about our non operating As you can see, we're here at Oxen Hill High School on February the 6th. There are no more upcoming budget work sessions. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Colleagues, um, thank you for being with us and joining us. And we probably still have some more that's coming. I know the traffic is really bad out there on the railroad, so I'm pretty sure a lot of them on their way. Uh, we'll begin now. Uh, if any, uh, I will now begin with questions from my colleagues. We will adhere to the five minute, three minute rule. So, we'll go first. Mr. Nick. As always, thank you, Mr. Fister. I appreciate Chief Fister. Uh, thank you for your uh, introduction and uh, comprehensive analysis of the additions to the budget. Um, I just had a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is probably for Dr. Watts. I was one. We're having trouble he hearing you. Uh, I think the mics, we just have to be really close to them when we speak. Is this better? OK, I'll stay at this level. Um, Dr. Watts, is there anything in this budget uh, to address the overcrowding of North County schools? To address overcrowding? Yes. Uh, yes, ma'am. We have uh, some line items in there for temporary classrooms. Of course, our capital budget is to address uh, issues with overcrowding. Obviously, you know, we're going to the school right now. Um, and, you know, we have future plans to build other schools. Uh, but next year, uh, besides uh, tool growth, funds for uh, temporary buildings. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Uh, yes. Hold on one second. In the uh, operating funds, we have, I believe, it's $3.4 million to purchase 40 new temporary buildings. Uh, can you say that one more time, Mr. Stefano? You said $3.4 million for how many temporaries? I believe it's three point four. I don't have the number with me, uh, but it's to, it's to purchase and install 40 temporary buildings. 40? I believe it is. Okay. Ar around. Okay, that's good. Um, it's just you, you all know um, how much of a situation it is in North County with our increasing enrollment there. And I want to be sure that we have something in this budget to address some of the dire needs of North County schools as it relates to that. And, and in, in our operating budget, temporary buildings is really the only recourse we have. The capital budget needs to address the, the major issue mm -hmm. of overcrowding. But we're going to do what we can to alleviate that overcrowding. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and then my next question, as you probably would assume, uh, is around maintenance. And I'm glad to see that there's a there's $3.7 million additional in here for preventative maintenance. Um, my question is probably again for Dr. Watts or maybe Mr. Stefanelli, um, how much does it cost to address maintenance issues on a year by year basis in Prince George's or maybe the, just this year, how much have you all spent so far in addressing some of the maintenance needs? That's a pretty complicated question because we share the cost with our capital programs. A lot of the big okay. ticket items come out of our capital programs budget. Um, we were afforded, I believe it was $10 million in maintenance supplies. Uh, this year, as you know, we got an increase from five, I think it was 5.4 million last year. 
Um, that's just for our maintenance supplies. The, the salaries for employees are captured in another portion of the budget. Our budget was 60, I believe $68 million this year in total. Okay, I guess um, my follow-up question to that is, is what's being requested in this budget enough to address some of the expected needs for next year? Could we use more? What's being requested in this budget is um, we're, we're looking to establish two programs, mm -hmm. a maintenance medic program and an apprenticeship program that will put us on the path to a better workforce and allow us to do more preventative maintenance. Those two programs independently are going to be a challenge to implement. We're going to attempt to implement both of those to give us the foundation to grow. We, we talked last year about our inability to, to, uh, to hire mechanics off the street, so we want to bring them in and start to train them ourselves. Once we get this established, then we can ask for additional resources for, for, for more positions at a later date. But we really need to focus on setting the foundation. Ms. Ahmed, mm -hmm. um, the question that you asked, we have a lot of systems that are aging. And some of those systems need to be, be replaced and there's a priority order for them. Okay, so some of those systems, we spend money fixing them because we don't have the funds today to replace them. So we may, you know, we may have, just giving you an example, we may have 30 systems that we need to replace, but we're only able to replace seven next year. So we still have a number of systems that need to be replaced, and in order to keep them running, sometimes we have to continuously work on and maintain those systems. So some of those costs are, if you will, unexpected. You know, we can't predict all of that. Um, so there, there's always a need to replace our aging systems, and that's been our challenge. Yes, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Stefanelli, Dr. Watts, Mr. Fawcett, who is probably here somewhere I can't see. He's down there. Um, I just want to thank you all and your team for all of your hard work and efforts. I know that this winter season, you all have spent, your team has spent hours upon hours through the night to make sure that our kids have a space to learn uh, that's warm, that's not leaking, uh, so I really appreciate those efforts. Um, I just want to be an ally to you and an advocate to you in making sure that you have what you need to be able to continue to do the work that you do. Um, so thank you, and please do use me as that advocate. Um, I, so I'll switch gears, and if it's okay, talk about something from last week. And this is probably directed to you, Dr. Goldson. Um, as we were talking last week about um, restorative practices and behavioral interventions. I was doing a little bit more research on PBIS um, and how it's been in our school system for a significant number of years. Um, I just don't know if a lot of the school communities engage in PBIS to the degree and to the level that I think we could be at. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, one-time funds for PBIS could be helpful um, in encouraging and empowering the school communities to use that framework better. So we have a variety of schools that are at different levels for PBIS. Mm -hmm. So I think before we put a pool of funds in to um, a pop of PBIS, I recommend that I provide you the list of schools, the levels, and then how long they've been implemented. Because sometimes in some schools it's just a way of doing business now versus those who are early in the infancy stages of year two or three of it and are at a different level. At the state level, though, Maryland State Department of Ed does come in and monitor the implementation and then provides awards to those schools who have done a certain amount of work um, and has become ingrained in the culture in that building. So I don't want to commit to saying, yeah, a pot of funds will help without looking at where each school is and see how many folks are not at the goal. Okay. I, I would definitely uh, want to commit to having further conversations with you about that because it's my understanding that there's a low percentage of schools that are truly like 100% the ideal schools that are implementing PBIS. 
And I know that um, the PBIS framework uh, can be very helpful in progressing some of our other agenda items of restorative justice and restorative practices, which we've piloted uh, this year. So I want to make sure that we're keeping in mind all the behavioral supports that we have in place in our schools, where we're trying to go forward, and how we can make sure we strengthen those foundations so that as we're moving forward, um, that's also, that progress is also strong. So that's all for me for now. Thank you. Mr. Burroughs. Yes, thank you. I do want to uh, first recognize, um, I believe, if my vision is not failing me, the police major from District 4 is in the back. And he's worked very hard. There he is. Who, you know, we had a shooting um, incident here, and he, he and his team have worked um, around the clock very hard. Um, they had a lot of additional police at the school today, and um, he's been working very closely with the, with the school system. So I did want to thank you openly, sir, for your work um, here at Oxon Hill. Not to take away my time, Ms. Uh, Berkeley. Um, but uh, I guess my, my question is also for Sam Stefanelli. No, you were just wanting on my clock as he was walking up. Like, <laughs> uh, Sam, I think R R Rahila sort of hinted at this earlier, but I'm, I'm just still unclear at the answer. We have a major maintenance issue in the school system, and your team is working very hard. I mean, I see your team out at schools all the time. You know, you get there early, stay there late, you're there over the weekends, and so you guys are working very hard. Uh, but it's still a major, major issue. You know, when I walk into a special ed class at Oxen Hill Middle School and I see students with coats and hats on in wheelchairs because the windows are messed up and the heating isn't working in the building, you know, we have an issue. Or mold at Isaac Ordeen or District Heights. I mean, all throughout the system, we have these huge maintenance issues. Um, and the, the work order uh, process. Maybe it works in some cases, in other cases it's not working. I mean, there's a capacity problem or a, uh, there, there, there is something wrong there. Um, and I think what Ms. Ahmed was trying to allude to is figuring out, you know, what would it take for you to, um, uh, what, what do we need to put in this budget to, to make that a little bit easier or better for next year and I know you said you wanted to get those two programs off the board before you requested additional funding but the reality is is that if you're um, uh, if you are a sixth grader Isaac Ordeen and half your heat doesn't work you don't have that year to wait till your programs get off the, the, the board so I mean what what needs to happen in this budget in order to, to fix some of those issues and the reality is it's it's a capital issue um, we have such an aging infrastructure that it we're, we're remaining reactive and you could increase and give us more funding the funding that you gave us last year has gone a long way to help us uh, take care of the issues we have but the reality is the infrastructure is aging and it's aging more and more every year and until we get a handle and start to be able to perform preventative maintenance and to increase the, the level of skill sets of our workforce it, it's more money is not going to be the answer. The maintenance medic program is designed um, to train our custodial staffs in the building to do minor maintenance work, which will go a long way to help alleviate these issues where uh, we can't respond fast enough. That will give us someone with maintenance ability in every facility to take care of the small stuff so we can take care of the larger stuff. So we feel that will have an impact on the issues that that you're talking about, um, but the capital program is where that has to take place. The, win the windows the, um, and the aging heating systems are capital programs, especially the windows. You have single pane windows in the center block structure, and it's five degrees outside. Even if the system's working properly, it's gonna be cold in that facility. So the capital program is, I think, where we need to focus our attention. I, I think that's what Dr. Maxwell is, is working on. You know, Ideally, we need more money in capital funds, but 
if, if there is mold in the school today and they email it and they don't hear a response two, three, four weeks, four weeks go by, you know, that's not a capital flooding problem. That's an internal work order management problem or issue. And so I'm not sure if it's because of, you know, if it's not because of resources, you know, that, that's, we, we just can have this continue to happen. And I agree, obviously we have huge capital needs, but, um, you know, when I went to Isaac Gordon, they, they told me that when the contractors installed the, the heating units a few years ago, some of the heating units that they installed have never worked. And no one from the district um, came in to make sure that the contractors did their job. I mean, they were supposed to be um, uh, drainage in certain places, and n none of that took place, but we paid the contractors anyway. And so I mean, that's not really a capital issue. It's, I mean, I'm assuming that your, your staff is stretched so thin that it's difficult to, to kind of deal with some of these things. And, and that is part of the problem, but we do have an increase, a substantial increase in, the, in, in personnel and maintenance in this budget. Um, I believe it's, uh, correct if I'm wrong, it's 80, 82 personnel. We have people in our environmental office. We have the, um, uh, we have the apprentice program and we have about 27 other positions. So there's there's a substantial increase in our workforce to help us take care of those issues. This, this isn't just two standalone programs. I think the CEO has requested a budget that's wide reaching. It helps us help us start to uh, address all of our issues. Well, I hope so because we can't have some of these repeats with these issues in the future. And at the end of the day, we're gonna have to hold the superintendent accountable for, for getting the job done in these schools. Um, and so if you're confident that this budget will do that, then um, I, I'm hopeful that I'll never have to walk into a school again that um, has said, you know, we told me and said we have mold in the school and they haven't been here in three weeks. You know, that that's not... Well, and I gotta say, you went to Isaac Wardain, we talked about this. We were already there when you got there. You walked in in the middle of the bus doing doing some work in that facility. No. I understand. I'm not going to no. argue with you. I understand we had a major problem right. for a long period of time, but once it was brought to our attention, we jumped on that pretty quickly and took care of the issues. Well, I don't, I don't know what it is. What I, what I can tell you is that I have letters from teachers there, five teachers there who were sick because, I mean, according to them, mold, and I have several pictures of black mold throughout the school. And when I hear the school officials tell me that, um, you know, this has been going on persistently and nothing's been done, and we've reported this to, I mean, maybe as a system we need to clarify who principals report this to, uh, because I never want to ever have to again um, deal with something like that. And yes, your folks got on it when it came to the, you know, when I called you guys, you got on it, but I'm not going to hear everything. And so the process should work without my intervention, is what I'm saying. And so I'm very thankful for your team. You guys did a great job. You know, when I called your office and uh, with, with the heating and, and, and the mold issue, but I'm not going to hear everything in schools. And so the process needs to work absent of board intervention. And, and I have to say, for every time that you're called, there are hundreds of issues that we deal with on a daily basis without that. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I hadn't brought to your attention, but the reality is we react as soon as we possibly can with the resources we have available. And I believe the resources we, we get this year will go a long way to help us do, do a better job. Okay. okay. I, I just don't want to rush in. And if you rush in and go out and hire 30 or 40 people, I'm afraid we're going to end up with a workforce that is large, but the skill sets won't be there. We need to develop the skill sets that are required for our school. Understood. And I appreciate your work. I just want to make sure that you have what you need to execute. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions? Ms. Green? I just had a quick follow-up to to um, the facilities and just maybe a recommendation. And I don't know if we we've, we've done if we've done it. And I'm sure we have. It's just if there's a way to sort of survey the schools because I I believe the the tool that you're referring to was came 
came about, is it two years ago maybe? The one that sort of tracks the logs? Yeah. Was it two years or a year ago? The third year. So yeah, so a lot of times, I mean, my understanding in working with a lot of those different types of systems, there's always glitches to sort of clear up. But it would be great to sort of survey and sort of see what, because it could be things that people are going in and they're not going through. I mean, there, there could be so many other things. Um, but I just was wondering if there's a way to survey and then sort of collect to see what people think about the actual usage of it and how effective it is. And I have to tell you, when I first took over, the reality was we were not using the system as it was designed. We spent the last year completely revamping how we use that system. We have a whole new set of uh, policies and procedures that we use because it was, you're absolutely right, we were generating data that was, that was no good to us. So now we're able to generate data and see how we're actually doing, whereas before, if we were just going in circles and the data was so skewed, I, I couldn't use it for any type of planning. But we started to correct that uh, on our maintenance, on the work order side, and now we're pushing, pushing that to the preventative maintenance side. This Williams. Good afternoon. Sorry about my voice. We got this tonight, so I won't be talking about it. Um, I just wanted to talk about the capital maintenance program that we have. There has been several studies that talk about what our capital needs are, and we have since implemented a program that will start to alleviate some of those issues. Can you talk about that, that program? So the, the last study we did, the, uh, the EFMP, Educational Facilities Master Plan, uh, put together a study that basically shared that over the course of the next 20 years, we need approximately $8.5 billion to uh, build our schools to be adequate for our schools, modernize the schools that are aging, and build those schools that are aging. Um, over the last year and a half, we've been looking at this program and there are some challenges with this. The challenges are that uh, in order to receive those kind of funds, we need to triple, in some case, more than triple the current funds that we get, which is challenging. So uh, there's a lot of things going on in the state, uh, the permanent commission, and uh, the 21st Century Commission, and uh, yeah, the NOC Commission. And, and in that, uh, they're looking at ways to, um, and this is statewide, to look at ways to um, fund the school district to, to lower costs, to lower some of the, um, the administrative uh, time it takes to build schools, things like that. Um, there are um, you know, agencies out there looking at alternative means of building partnerships with private public partnerships um, in ways that the school system may be able to leverage the funds that it receives to Process to finish in five years. We're hoping to do that in three years. So there are you know, there are a lot of um, things in motion right now. Um, you know, the Irwin Commission is starting to get recommendations. The 21st Century is starting to get recommendations, and there's some things going on in the state delegation as well to look at um, ways to help schools. Based on the way we operate today, or if we were to continue to move along the track that we move along to improve our, our school system, our buildings, we use the EFMP as that implementation on an annual basis. And so we, you all make recommendations to us on the EFMP for that year, yes. every year. What time frame is that? When does that come before? This is an annual process. We, we start in the fall, uh, and what we do is we begin uh, a process of recommending uh, what we need for capital. 
following year. We send that to state and uh, MSP, um, IAC in particular, uh, to request funds from the state and the county. So what, what we've done this year, um, in the past we, we've sent up a hundred projects or so. Uh, this year we submitted about 28, uh, 28 projects, modernizations, and some major systems. Uh, in the past, Last year we asked for over $1 million. Uh, this year we asked the state for approximately $70 million. Um, and, and we asked the county for about $1 million for last year. And we've tried to focus on less projects, um, modernizations, um, less projects that go to the state. So the systemic projects, we, uh, the state funds us a, a portion of it percentage of the, the uh, project and the county uh, funds us in the The county funds more. We usually should receive more funds annually from the county government. Um, the challenges we have is um, when you submit a hundred projects, for example, you have to submit all the paperwork for all hundred projects, um, which can be very time consuming. Uh, and in some cases when you have a hundred different projects and you design them projects throughout the year, um, and in some of our cases in the past, we've fallen behind in some of these designs. Um, this year, with, with lowering the number of designs and focusing in on modernizations um, that are going to the state, um, we've had a lot of this paper this year um, that goes to the state. So it's been, it's been helpful. Ms. Williams, we do have a lot of challenges. This year basically comes out on page 23 of the budget. The list of projects that we are looking at to do some modernization and some major projects. So when we talk about our, our large capital needs and then we come into an annual discussion on the PFMP, it rolls out on page 23 of the budget. Basically. So when we're when we're talking about um, when you talk about going from the, the 100 projects that we used to submit to 70 so, um, I heard two things that, that we had challenges with. One was funding and getting the funding that we need. But two, you also mentioned the timing. And in my mind, that comes as a result of the, the number of staffing resources we have to put towards that. And so when we talk about that and we submit it, you mentioned at another meeting, or your staff mentioned that, on occasion we only received a C grade from the state. Therefore, we could not get funded for that to move that project forward. And so at some point when we're looking at projects that are listed on our CIP, we see projects fall behind. And you're saying because of funding one, and because of resources, human capital resources that we can put towards that. So this new way of doing things, submitting less projects, allows us to focus and submit a better project, will get us to dealing with the challenges of equipment not working or putting band-aids or mold issues that we realize in the, throughout the year. Because I see here, when you're talking about systemic projects, we see roofing issues, envelope issues. Those can help us prevent mold from occurring. If we can enclose that up envelope to make sure that moisture stays out. And so, so when we're talking about the process and procedure, we know that it's $8 million is what we need. We know we're not gonna get that, at least not in one year. And if we did, we don't have the resources to implement that. So, the way we do it is to do EFMP, approve that at some point during the year, and we come up with this CIP list. So when we look into our big CIP list book that is huge, 
we should be able to follow and track these projects along. Yes, and we've kept the priority rule of our projects inside the year. So all the that's projects. Mm -hmm. We're trying to focus on the top priority projects. Um, we've added more modernization as possible. just shifting gears on the other piece that you spoke about on the other alternative ways of funding our new school construction and major renovations. Do you have a time on that in which we're going to be able to hear more about that, you know, as the state jumps on board or the county jumps on board? Yes, ma'am. So we have been working with the county government in conversations, and this is, uh, this has a lot to do with financing. So this alternative means, uh, instead of financing, procuring a building over a three-year period, procuring over a 30 year period. So the, the county, the state, the school system may buy a building for $2 million a year for 30 years, as opposed to $25 million a year. So uh, we're looking at ways, we mentioned earlier, we have an overcrowded situation. We really need to build like, three to five schools right now. Um, if we're able to secure an alternative financing method to build three to five schools, it would really help us out to resolve some of these issues that we're having in the world in particular. Um, so we are working uh, with the state. So I definitely would be interested in, in following that and hearing more about that. Because today, we, as we phase the projects in, we go through design, we go through permitting, we go through construction, we're drawing down funds that may total $80 million. So at the day that we open the building, we own that building. And you're saying that the alternate means of financing will mean that we'll pay that over a period of time. Alternative means, and in some cases, the alternative means the you know, financier will own the building for the course of four or five or years, whatever that, that time frame is. And they'll also maintain the building as well. Uh, so there are some advantages to that in the area. Um, it might take a little bit off the building, the shops, and they don't have to maintain the solution. They can maintain and operate the process. And so I think that that is. Um, it would be to our advantage, you know, not only more buildings quicker and sooner, but also having 200 and what, eight or nine schools with our limited number of staff on a winter day or a summer day to respond to those issues of heating and cooling, this would support our staff in, in getting that done. So, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I've had a few questions. Um, too close? Is that better? Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, so just some quick questions. Um, as it relates to dual enrollment, um, how are we looking at improving enrolling that number? I see you have an additional, is it additional 800,000 on top of last year? Sorry. Did you say dual enrollment? Yes. So the increase in dual enrollment is for the increase in uh, tuition rates. Let me go back here. Okay, from the okay at the community well, college. It's, it's for tuition rates, textbooks for those students who are free and reduced meals, and we've had an increase in the number of students who access dual enrollment. So through our PTEC, our three D scholars, and in our increase in dual enrollment so for the first time in several years since we've had it, we're up to 600 students in um, our spring class. So that's to 
to include the cost for all those new programs and the increase in our existing number of students in dual enrollment. Okay, and in its inception, did we ever put a cap on that, or is that just as open-ended no. through state law that we have to provide that? Correct. Okay. If the student does well on the accumulation, we can test them. Okay, um, I'm not sure you answer this question, but I'm, I just wanted to get some clarification on the what the cultural training entails within high-performing workforce. Is that sort of cultural competency? Uh, is that professional development mostly, or is that recruitment? Thank you. That would be con um, continuation of our Arbinger training that we've been doing for the past few years. Okay. Uh, the question around family and community engagement, the additional 304,000. Where would that put us um, as it relates to the number of parent engagement assistants? For that I know we were somewhere a year ago, close to I think 60 or so, uh, if I'm mistaken. Where would this get us with additional funding as far as placement at target schools? I caught just about every other word <laughs> much of the time. Family and community engagement, what the $1.1 million will get us? Is that yeah, but I, I, I see this specifically the parent engagement assistants, those who are you know placed in schools. 304, yes. 304. How many additional assistants will that buy us? Give me a half a second, I'll look that up. Okay. I asked because um, in my previous role uh, as chair of the parent uh, family and community engagement, at least there were some members of that body who. We're pushing for you know one at every school. We understand that that's you know not easy, but we make progress at the school that needed the most. I was curious about if this um, passes where that would put us as far as placement within every school. It would be an additional five. Additional five. Okay. Yes. Um, other question, particularly around communication equipment. Um, I know we hired someone um, to run that department. Uh, I think Randall's here. Pike. Congratulations. What um, equipment are we purchasing? What would that be for? In my, in my conversations with Mr. Rhodes, I believe it has something to do with the equipment behind your dais, some of the equipment there that needs to be updated, some of the cameras. I believe it's going from an analog to a digital, um, but basically being able to you know, live stream our meetings and things like that. Needing to update some of the equipment there. Okay. Um, okay, that's all I have at this time. questions before I go to round two. So Mr. Watts, Dr. Watts, I'm sorry, can you explain to me um, what's, what the, I think on slide 12 we have preventive maintenance, maintenance mechanical shops, and then on slide Seven, we have facility supplies and contractor services. Can you tell me what the difference is for those different three categories? Uh, so, what is the preventive maintenance? Uh, I think it's, it's like almost two, two, two million, two million for that one. Uh, yes, sir. I don't have access to the slides, but the preventive maintenance portion is uh, where. We're adding the maintenance medic program. I can't hear you. Can you we're speak? adding the maintenance medic program, and we're adding, I believe, some equipment operators and custodial help. So we have more staffing at the schools. So we, that's where the preventative maintenance starts, is with the staffing at the schools to give us the trained personnel at the school level to begin the preventative maintenance. Ms. Boston, that was 30 cleaners and seven building operators. Right, so the, so, so the preventive maintenance is more for staffing. Is that what I'm hearing? Staffing, and I believe there's some uh, supply money in there also. And then the maintenance mechanical shops, that's more for, is that staffing as well for? Um, I, I'm not looking at the slide, but that sounds like the, the supplies for the maintenance shops. Uh, the maintenance and mechanical staffing, there's uh, 27 FTE to address uh, plumbing, water stoppage, flooding, health inspection concerns, provide preventative maintenance with stormwater lines to alleviate plumbers, uh, to perform other duties, uh, provide
provides additional plumber positions to address new compliance and safety mandates by the Safe Schools Initiative, um, establish an in-house insulation service to reduce costs of contracted services, and to address the mold and mildew concerns. So, uh, and so is that, for, is that staffing as well, or is that it, just? It is, yes ma'am, it's 27. 27 okay. Then the facility supplies and contractor services, that's, what, what is that? That's just for? That's an increase to our ability to contract services and supplies for our maintenance department. For the maintenance department, yes. supplies is for the maintenance. So on slide 10, where it says student informa information system reporting, can you explain to me exactly what, what is that for? Is that to, uh, to address some of the issues that we've had with um, how we input grades or? Actually, ma'am, we have a product called Performance Matters that's currently being paid for under a grant. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so is that to is that to update our school the school max or exactly? Because I didn't see any funding funding in here to address those type of issues. So did you put anything in? So this budget the, for that. The line item that you're seeing there is particular. It's a reporting system that teachers use, teachers and principals use, um, and it's also for um, testing as well. It's a performance matters. It's a platform. Um, currently, we're working on uh, uh, several things inside of SchoolMax to, uh, to address some issues. Um, one, we are working on the tallying of credits. Okay, mm -hmm. so staff are internally working on that uh, now to have that ready for next school year. Um, we're using in-house staff to, to configure the system. Um, we're also developing an application for electronic grade change, for, um, and that's in process now. That'll be piloted in the spring and ready for next school. Well. Okay. So we already have funding yes, built in for that. We okay. are addressing them as we speak. Okay. Thank you. So round two. So I have Mrs. Um, Grady. No. Mrs. Ahmed. Thank you, Ms. Boston. Um, Dr. Watson, I just wanted to say I'm thank thankful to you for talking about alternative financing. I know it's something that I've asked uh, about uh, in public forums as it relates to capital budget, and it's really good to see that there's the state commission that's doing work, but also the system officials like yourself that are talking about it publicly as well. Um, my question is around bus lots. I know that last year we had a huge um, kind of a field trip to the bus lots in Prince George's County, which I'm thankful for. Uh, I was wondering if there's anything in this budget to address some of the needs of our bus lots. So, Ms. Ahmed, we received $4 million last year in last year's funding. Uh, we've designed um, some uh, new garages and some bus depots. Okay, so in the fall, Break ground on those projects, um, which we will have, uh, I think it's four or five, uh, two or three garages and a uh, depot or two. Uh, Dr. Saunders, um, we, um, they're in process now uh, for going out to bid for those, uh, for those awards, but that is in process now. Can we get uh, or expect an uh, update on that when we talk about the capital budget? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and then my next question, would you like to say something, sir? No. Okay. <laughs> you look ready, so. <laughs> just in case. Um, my next question is for Mr. Antar. I, I was just wondering uh, if you could provide an overview of some of the uh, innovations that were 
we would like to have in IT uh, with the additional funds that are in this budget. I'm not sure if there's uh, additional funds referred to. Are you talking about the fresh funds? Is that what you discussing? Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Are you talking about the fresh funds? Whatever a new things are here. Yeah, we're working on multiple uh, level of uh, upgrading infrastructure so we can provide better digital services to the schools and provide better uh, technology to students. Uh, we're also working on multiple upgrades for uh, student information systems uh, and the Oracle ERP and make it easier for our users to use. Um, we also working on training, uh, working with uh, Dr. Spencer. Uh, to uh, we had discussion many times about having open labs, uh, continuous training. Uh, we also upgrading our uh, filter system, web filtering system, and um, several other projects in the, in the making. And we also do under fresh. This year we refresh the uh, teachers' uh, laptops. Uh, next year we're going to work on the uh, uh, employees and also uh, try to meet the one-to-one -one requirement. Uh, increase the number of schools from currently 10 schools to perhaps uh, 15 this year. And next year we're targeting 10 more schools. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another random question. I would that might be a Christian question. Um, I was wondering how much is in this budget uh, for fingerprinting for families? Would it be the same amount that we had last year? It's the same amount as last year, yes, ma'am. Okay, and would it have the same stipulation um, that we had voted on as a board last year, which was we would uh, prioritize farms families and release the remaining funds to uh, remaining families? I can get you an update as to exactly what that funding, I mean, where we are so far this year. Because as you know, it was sort of piloted last year. Okay, thank you. And then my last question is about our, our grants. So are there any new grants that we're pursuing this year that we have not pursued in previous years or that maybe we did pursue in previous years that we're going to try again for? So we're, we're uh, one of a number of states that have been in a convening by the Carnegie uh, folks. And they're, um, they're talking about improvement science and how districts improve across the country. And they're seeking some funding through Carnegie and Gates. I don't know where that's going to land. That's a pretty early conversation. There's also a community schools grant, too, that um, John uh, White forwarded to us over the weekend that we're taking a look at. That our partners at county government are eligible to apply for that with us in support. Um, and it's all that I can think of. Here. Okay, thank you. I think that's a, a good start of and, and a good couple of programs that or uh, programs that we could be applying for. I only ask because of um, knowing that we're not reapplying for Head Start funds. Um, it's ref it's it's. It makes me feel good that we're applying for other grants in other areas to be able to assist our students and knowing that we're not pursuing that avenue specifically. Thank you. question around recruitment and retention, but it's for three different subgroups. And so I think the first one probably for you, Dr. Sanders, uh, with regards to bus drivers. Uh, I'm also curious about who would also be able to speak to this question um, around nurses and then around um, particularly early uh, teachers in the first second year. What are we doing differently and particularly how will this budget help you to recruit and retain bus drivers uh, that you will need uh, come, come August? 
So one of the things we've done working with human resources is had two job fairs a month with the explicit purpose of recruiting drivers, attendants, and also our central garage personnel. One of the things we've been able to do through the means of the budget is while recruiting individuals who may not already have their CDL, we've been able to provide classes for them that we provide training, paid training, while they work towards their CDL and they start off with the learners. So that has helped us to increase, as we remember, at a 96% completion rate of individuals who enter that class actually passing their MBA license, getting their CDL, and we've been able to put them to work both in terms of being drivers or as our central garage personnel. That has allowed us to make a big hit in our vacancies so that we've worked our way down from the beginning of the year when we were hovering you know, 80 to 100 people to where we're down now, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 20 MTEs that we still have. So will this uh, 246,000 um, and additional staffing in HR, will that impact you in any way or is your understanding that you will be able to do that with the existing staff you have in HR? Well, it, it'll help us. One of the things we're looking to do through HR is bring on a person who may be a dedicated HR person just for transportation, so that it can also help in our turnaround of reviewing the documentation for people when we recruit them to get them signed up and started on board a lot faster so that we're able to concentrate with them a lot of different pieces that have to go into play with the background check, licenses, dealing with MBA, MSDEs, regulations, et cetera. So we think that's going to expedite that and also help us keep interest from when we first interview people to being able to bring them to the Okay, thank you. Uh, a similar question for what we'll be able to talk about our school nurses and recruitment and retention of that group. That's a good idea. So for our school nurses, we're continuing to use contracted services um, to fill the gap where we our negotiations team to determine ways that we can increase the salary for nurses um, because we are in competition with um, outside agencies for um, nurses. In addition, looking at using um, certified nurse assistants in some locations where the acuity rate is low and don't necessarily need a rubber Is Where is that reflected? I mean, I guess those um, that outside contractors, is that reflected in this presentation or just it's just... Yeah. It's, it's rolling over from last year. Has the goal ever been to have a full-time nurse in every school? I mean, I don't, since I've been on the board, I don't think we've had that, but I, you know, if, if I do hear you know, complaints from parents, it is that they have a nurse that's not there full-time. Yes, our goal, is, our goal is to have a full-time nurse in every school. It's the time that we have. Um, but I think the man across the The last question is, how are we uh, doing with retention, or how does this budget speak to retention of first and second year teachers? Thank you. And this particular budget may not be addressing that because, as you know, we were awarded that $25 million grant, that, and that directly addresses the retention and the recruitment of our newest um, employees. Do they disaggregate that by subgroups? And so, you know, whether it be Latino teachers, male teachers, or it's just sort of universally first year teachers, is there any plan to sort of target certain subgroups that we believe we're, we need because of our population or because we've, we've lost them in the past at a higher rate? Yes. So this particular grant does not necessarily differentiate among diversity. However, we are excited that next week, either this week or next week, we will be unveiling our diversity plan when it comes to and that is part, not part of the $25 million grant, but it's part of our strategic plan of increasing diversity in the teaching staff. Any colleagues, any more questions? Okay. So, again, thank you for participating in the budget work session for the FY 2019 proposed operating budget. This concludes the February 6, 2018 fiscal year 2019 operating budget work session.
is adjourned at 6.15 p.m. Please note, please note, the budget public hearing will begin at 7 p.m. But if we have a list of speakers here, so I'm ask my colleagues if they, if they would like, we can either take a short break, um, then come back. And if some of the speakers are here, if they want to begin early, we can do that. Um, we will go past 7 o'clock. Uh, regardless, so as other speakers that may not be here now, they, when they come in, we will go on and hear from them as well. So this is up to Tony. We'll take a maybe 15 minute break and start back at 6.30. Uh, how many speakers are here that signed up to speak today? If you can raise your hand. Any? Oh, well. So we'll, we'll come back at 6.30, and if there's no speakers that have signed up, um, here yet, then we'll just wait until 7 o'clock and then we'll begin there. Okay? Thank you. We tried. 